You're listening to Paris Search Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. Paris Search Radio, broadcasting to the UK and beyond. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Haunted Histories with your host, Penny G. Morgan, right here on Parasearch Radio. And a very warm welcome to all of you this evening. Yes, tonight we are totally 100% live. I'm chewing on my fingernails in the hope that although I love thunderstorms, we don't have one tonight that knocks out the broadcasting system. So please do keep your fingers all crossed for me. Well, tonight and very shortly, we're going to be talking to the incredibly knowledgeable and good friend to Parasearch, Mr. Ashley Nibb about Peterborough Museum. You may not have heard of this place, but I would wager it will be somewhere that you um, will want to visit once you've heard of all the experiences that he's going to tell. Before that, how are we all? Well, we've been working hard at Parasearch for you to bring another competition. You know the score. Head over to the page. But this one is two tickets to an investigation at the Chocolate Factory in Hull with our very own Kaz Rooney and also the Ouija Brothers. Sadly, though, this is not like Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, and if you want chocolate, you need to take your own. But it's a pretty awesome place, nevertheless. And, um, yeah, you need to go and check out the competition and, you know, like it, share it, all of that stuff. I'll leave it to you. You know what to do. So, what else? What else are we up to? Um, well... Let's see. We've got a new our website. We've got new blogs going up on there. Um, my new blog, talking about history, obviously, will be going up there very, very soon, imminently. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's loads of new content going up, and you may get to see videos of all the presenters doing their thighing, if you ask nicely. So, Peterborough. Well, before I bring in Ashley and press the unmute button, and right now I'm just getting messages from people telling me they can't actually get into the studio. So if anyone is actually listening to this and can hear the show, can they actually leave a message for us? Because, funnily enough, I'm refreshing it like crazy and mine isn't working either. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. bit concerning. Um... Yeah, I think what we're going to do is we're going to refresh the page and we're going to start again because nobody seems to be able to... The messages I'm getting is, Hi, Kaz, can you hear us now? Can you let me know if you can hear us? Ah, you're there. Cool. Cool, banana. So obviously it's working now. It's just my phone that's playing up. Anyway. God, I hate going live. I'm not doing this again. Um, It's okay this end. I presume that's Paul or is that Kerry? I don't know. Thank you, Kaz. Kaz is sharing out the show, so hopefully people are all listening. Um, yeah, I'm not doing this live shit again. No, I'm, I'm sticking with my proof because Ashley's actually laughing in my ear because you can't hear him right now, but I can. And he's actually said evening as well. Even twice he said evening. So it must be good now. Anyway, so Peterborough. Hi, Kerry. Thanks for tuning in, my love. So the Internet's working down in the Isle of Wight. Good, good. Well, before I bring him, Ashley, like I said, and I press the unmute button, I have the power. I have this power, you see. I can mute people when they're saying things I don't want to hear, or I don't want you to hear anyway. The museum is um, the site of a former mansion sort of type house, which was actually built in 1816. Although it's believed that the cellar part of it dates back even further to the mid-1500s from the original dwelling that was on that site. And... 
This property was built as a townhouse for the local magistrate, one Thomas Kirk, and to be quite honest, whoever he was married to at the time, because he was actually married three times, and I think it was his wife Judith who died shortly after the property was completed, and then he he his marriage to a lady by the name of Charlotte, who he lived there with, and subsequent divorce from said Charlotte, was a bit of a local social scandal. Anyway, after his death in 1854, the property, um, okay, just put, she's, she's about, she's just about there, sent everyone to bed early. <laughs> we haven't had any storms here today. I'm gutted. I tell you what, I love thunder. I love thunder and lightning. I think it's fab. Um, but where I've been staying at my parents in East Anglia, we've had none the last few days. Essex has had literally Sodom and Gomorrah throwing itself at it with storms. I come back home to Essex nothing nada not one crack of lightning i'm actually quite disappointed anyway after thomas cook's death in 1854 the property was sold to earl fitzwilliam who donated it to be used as a hospital from 1856 to 1928 when the war memorial hospital was actually built in peterborough to pay homage to those who had fought and lost their lives during the Great Great War some 10 years earlier. And it's this period that I'm going to focus on for my history bit, the actual Great War, or the First World War as some people might know it as, as I feel it's got the most interesting story to tell attached with the history side of Peterborough. Not the ghost side, but the history side, but you will see where it links in. And I want to talk to you about the lonely Anzac, as he's known. Well, his name was Thomas Hunter, and he's remembered annually in the city by a commemorative service on the 25th of April, even though he wasn't a son of Peterborough at all. He was born in May 1880, actually in County Durham, up north, and he emigrated to Australia at the age of 30 in 1910. Now, as did many men, he volunteered to fight at the outbreak of World War One in August 1914. And whilst he survived campaigns in Gallipoli, Egypt, it was in June of 1916 when he entered the frontline trenches of France for the first time. And it was the following day, the day after he went to France, that he had his first injury. It was a minor shrapnel wound and Sergeant Hunter was sent to a casualty clearing station for treatment. Now, you might not realise, but the whole treatment of medical emergencies in the Great War had a very, very clear demarcation of responsibility. They had their aid and bearer relay posts. I guess kind of, I suppose you could look at it as an initial triage system by men just skilled in first aid right at the front. And then they had the field ambulance, which was actually a medical unit and not just a vehicle. And this would provide dressing stations for those assessed by the relay posts and then either return casualties to the front, which did happen on, a, you know, patch them up, send them back, or they would evacuate them to the next bit, the casualty clearing stations. This was a larger and probably more well-equipped medical facility that wasn't designed to move around. It was fixed. Now, these casualty centres, a bit like in modern day A&E, were designed to hold around a thousand patients but during peak battle periods they could literally be overflowing with emergency cases. Now from there you could be moved by ambulance train or barge sometimes believe it or not to a base or field hospital and it was from here that you could get what was known as a blighty pass and it's a real thing somebody argued with me once it wasn't a real th it really was known as a blighty pass whereby you were going to be sent home to the UK for further treatment in one of the many military hospitals which had been established. Hi Henry! Now, many of these were quickly set up in private large houses, public buildings, and even some mental health asylums were requisitioned for this purpose. To give you an idea as to the scale of the problem, at the outbreak of World War One, the military had around 7,000 official hospital beds and around just under 300 regular members in their actual nursing service. Now, by the end of the war, with an estimated injury level that I've been able to find of around 19 million across both sides, 
the number of nurses had increased to over 10,000 in the UK. So that can give you a bit of an idea of how much the medical system was used. Now, with weakened immune systems and also being away from home, the high number of soldiers being treated not only for influenza, but also venereal disease was high. This is true. There were specific hospitals set up in the UK for men who were suffering with venereal disease from the brothels and the um, the friendly ladies back in the sort of on the, the front who were willing to look after them. And they, they weren't in trouble for contracting a venereal disease. They would only get in trouble with their CO if they tried to hide the fact they'd contracted some kind of venereal disease. And you may think, yeah, exactly, you were, Ashley. Yeah, I'm surprised you're not chuckling in my ear right now about this. But the statistics I found, and I find this, this astonishing, well, I don't actually, young men away from home needing the touch of a woman and all that, or maybe even a man, I don't know. No judgment here. But the statistics estimate that five times as many men were treated for conditions such as syphilis and gonorrhea than the more commonly known trench foot. Five times as many men had to be treated back home. Yeah, it is wow, isn't it, Ashley? You can't hear it. I can hear Ashley in my ear, but you can't hear him. He just went, wow. Yeah. So it, it was a problem and they had specific hospitals designed to deal with it. You only have to Google images of World War One hospitals to see the different setups that were in pretty much every large private house possible around the country, with ordinarily the man or the woman of the house having the role as com- commandant and the nursing staff being drawn from the domestics of the house and becoming voluntary assistants, if you like, VADs as they were known. Unfortunately, though, back to, to Thomas, this wasn't what befell Thomas Hunter. At the end of July 1916, he was part of what actually became known as the Battle of the Somme. And everyone knows that the Battle of the Somme was a bloodbath, to put it mildly. And in the early hours of July the 25th, he was seriously wounded in the legs and the spine. He followed the process of the medical treatment that I, I mentioned above and was transferred to the medical ship for treatment in the UK on the 29th of July to arrive in Portsmouth on the 30th. He was placed on a train in Portsmouth and was was headed towards the military hospital in Halifax in Yorkshire. Now, due to the sheer severity of his wounds and compounded by the jolting of the train and the travelling from the front to Portsmouth, the medical staff were so concerned about his health that they took the unusual step of saying, we're going to stop at a station. Whatever the next station is, he's going to have to go to hospital wherever we stop. And the nearest station to them was Peterborough. Sadly, Sergeant Hunter died the following day, the 31st of July. Away from home, perhaps scared and alone, except for the medical staff who had tried valiantly to save him. So moved by his plight, the mayor, and also he, this man was the secretary of the infirmary, the Peterborough Infirmary, one Alfred Caleb Taylor, arranged a civic funeral for the isolated Anzac and he was buried with full military honours. Now, with so many people of Peterborough paying homage to their adopted Australian son, is it any wonder that he may still remain there? It's time for Ashley now, I think, don't you? Are you ready, Ashley? How are you? Frequent flyer with spirit dimension and frequent flyer on the the, the power search page and you all probably know his wonderful blog that we share on a regular regular basis um how did you get into writing that blog by the way ashley um to be fair um but years and years ago i got into paranormal i've done, done a lot of reading and when i first started out um i've always i've always written um quite like old style journals like leather bound journals so Keeping right. information that I write about and things that I learn and um, investigations that I've always written them into like a little journal and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, hence why the Paranormal Investigators Journal came out in the end. Um, but I thought at some point I thought I need to share, I wanted to share with people my experiences, my 
um, investigations as they went. And, and to begin to begin with, it started off with my team because originally I had a team called Farsight um, Paranormal Investigation, um, right. Panel Research Society. And yeah. what I wanted to do is have a website where we could just share all our investigations and that kind of stuff, so that we could all share that with other people and big people could share with us, and we could all get an understanding of different locations and stuff like that. So that's kind of how the blog started. And initially, it was a website. And they were posts on the web on a website, but then it's too, it soon turned into a blog. Um, and as the, the team went went away and, it, um, and I became more solo kind of thing, mm-hmm. I I started writing a blog on the bits and pieces that I went to and saw and stuff like that. And that's kind of how it evolved and came into place. I've always loved writing as well, so it's it's one of the things I do enjoy doing. It is quite addictive, isn't it? Do you do you it's... find when you're writing a blog, you can either have either have those days when it takes you two minutes and you've written six hundred words. And then other days you are literally sitting there staring at the keyboard. Yeah, yeah I've, I've, I've had a few. I've had a few. Um, I find I find um, when I write stuff that I'm, I'm I haven't got I don't think about you know I just think okay, I'm going to write this and that's popped into my head so I'm going to write mm. about it and it will flow brilliantly. When I push myself to write things on specific things and uh, one of the ones that actually always trips me up is when I try to I, I do ser- every every now and then like a series of things like I'm, I'm trying to do a uh, 20 most haunted locations yes. in the world yeah, which is one yeah. I struggle massively with that because I know that I have to go and do a bit of research I know how to go and find some information out about it and link it in and and write it quite in a in a certain way yeah rather than the, the side Just theory blogs <laughs> yeah the, yeah the side the side theory ones are quite are quite they're like mind dumps basically yeah like I just drop my head onto onto the onto the computer and in, into the onto the website without any problem. They, I can do them in anywhere between thirty minutes to an hour and a half, depending on how long they are. Yeah. And um, but yeah, try to do an in-depth piece of research on a on a place as you you'll probably know. Mm. Um, the time length goes expands dramatically, and mm. the writing element kind of ends up in the middle somewhere. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I know. Well, I know when I'm researching for one of these shows, when I'm I'm doing the sort of the history research on a place that I'm going to be covering. I can be researching for anything two to twelve hours, probably, mm. depending on you know, how much cross referring I need to do and um, how well I know the place. I know when I, I did the, uh, the sh- that's one of the places mentioned on your list actually. I did the show on Arrowdale Asylum yes. with Bill Boney of the Australian Paranormal Society, and I say it myself, it, a fascinating show. Bill is just because he's very very good friends with Sarah Chumacera who does living life in full yes. spectrum um i mean she's a font of information bill he him and i talked history for three hours at four o'clock in the morning basically in my time our time um yeah, you can lose, lose yourself quite quickly in it can't you <laughs> well we did and we talked about everything from american to australian to because he's very well traveled as well so wow. he oh he's been all over the place um and so he was it, it was a very interesting one to do, but that one did take me a lot of research because it's not somewhere that I was that au fait with. Whereas um, if anyone who listens to the history bit that I did before the gremlins attacked, <laughs> <laughs> my World War One knowledge is, isn't, is quite good. So it's literally just double checking or going into, like say, as I was going into sort of some of the statistics on the hospital side, that's what I was having to look up as opposed to mm. how it worked and the battles and the time scales and, and all of those kind of things. So yeah, it can take, but as you say, when it's, it, I, I, I did a blog recently and it took me ages to write it. And then another one came into my head and that one took me two minutes and I had 700 words before I'd even yeah, that's finished exactly, my coffee sort of thing. It's exactly how it goes sometimes. It's, mm. it's, um, it's those ones that come really quickly. It's like, oh, thank God for that. And then, and then you, you can't sit there thinking, have I done enough? But then you look mm. at it, you think, I've done exactly the same amount. But yeah, the research, the research ones, which I, I like to try and do as much research as possible. I'm not saying that I'm in depth or thorough sometimes, but um, I don't think blog because blogs you can't go too long with blog, otherwise no. you end up losing your readers. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's yeah, it's. I, but then I lose myself sometimes. I'll go off on on some locations and I'll just go off on a tangent and find different things and then realise I need to get back and focus on what I'm trying to do, which is write a blog at the end of the day. Yeah, so you can yeah. get. Yeah. yeah and thanks so, yeah. kaz for sharing as much as we you can we're good we're gonna what we're going <laughs> thanks, to kaz. do hopefully in the next couple of days is knit the two parts of this show together so that they go out together on sort of youtube and and everything else and we'll reshare them out on facebook so that people know that there are two parts that they yeah. can listen to so they can listen to my sort of boring history bit and then listen to the interesting bit after the gremlins had attacked um 
yeah. the history bit of this one ties so well in with the actual ghosty bit. <laughs> it does, though, doesn't it? It does. It's one of the things, um, before, before we actually went quasi-live, Ashley and I were chatting about this kind of thing, and one of the things I will not budge on, and I will not budge on this, no matter how many people try and give me a different opinion, is how knowing history can help. Because I have a, one of my biggest bugbears... And it's my biggest bugbears. And it's interesting that we talk about this Sergeant Hunter being one of the fundamental characters associated with Peterborough Infirmary. And he, I believe, and you'll be able to correct me on this, is one of the most common entities that people believe that they see in there. Yes. And one of my biggest bugbears is... um, Hi, Henry. Thanks for coming back. Um, One of my (sighs) biggest bugbears is that people automatically assume that whatever the figure is, and I think I said this when I did my Q&A live the other week, is that it's always the most famous person associated with that place. So when they see a lady walking around the chapel at the Tower of London, it's got to be Anne Boleyn. It's got to be. can't be anyone else. When they see, um, I think at Warwick Castle, they always assume that when they hear the groans of someone is... um, Ah, oh, but Kaz, I'm going to quantify this. All right, I know you, you disagree with me on this one, but I am going to quantify the history thing. What, um, there was one of the, the murders that took place at Warwick. Everyone assumes it's the, the the guy whose name I've just completely forgotten. But actually, <laughs> it sounds really bad, but I've completely forgotten this guy's name. Mine's just gone blank. Um, King. No, it wasn't a kid. It wasn't Warwick the Kingmaker. No, it, uh, Grenville or Greville. Oh, uh, I can't remember his name. I could look it up if I was feeling. It's the same. Mind. It's the same with Warwick, where a lot of a lot of stuff might get associated um, with a certain guy that used to do seances in one of the rooms as well. There. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But He's this this guy, he was murdered by his manservant. But his manservant, he didn't die straight away. He didn't die for a month, and he didn't actually oh, die at Warwick Castle. He died elsewhere in London, actually, at a hospital in London. It was like in the sixteen seventeen hundreds. But his manservant killed himself straight away. He took a knife to his throat, I believe, exactly where he'd just stabbed his boss. Now, people say they hear a moaning and a sort of a dying sound. Well, nobody ever thinks it could be the manservant. He died in that room. The other guy didn't. But the other guy's the more famous one. If you you chuck in there about residual energy or um, things about um, emotions and that, you know... Um, imprinting themselves onto the environment, if that if if that's what people uh, believe, then mm. um, the person who would have experienced, or the individual, let's say in that circumstance, that would have had the most emotion would probably have been him, because obviously he's he's gone through the emotion of killing his boss, exactly. and then he's gone through the emotion yeah. of committing suicide himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so probably, and he did actually yeah. die in that room. So that yeah. that's one of the ones that I sort of I bring up with people that i'm actually looking at my notes on the place now because it's annoying me that i can't remember the guy's name but he um he didn't die there yet people automatically assume it's him that they hear i don't think so i think it could be the manservant but i might be wrong um no one knows i guess but that's one of the things about history now i understand what kaz is saying that she doesn't like to know too much of the history Um, and a lot of people say this to me because then they can be influenced too much but i Mm. think it's very very hard to go into somewhere that's well known and not even if it's in the back of your mind know something and it's that something that you might know that influences you rather than right folk greville i knew it was a granville or a greville folk (laughs) greville was the one there you go um but knowing something um can sometimes be not enough you know you want to be able to know and and the, the history doesn't always have to be the names of every single person who's lived there, but it's knowing. It, I, see, I, yeah, I, 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 I've I've just I've discussed this particular position um, with quite a few people because a lot of um, I've, done, I've done a lot of work with people who obviously do um, uh, mediumship and stuff like yeah. that. So when they want when they go in, they want to go in blind and stuff yeah. like that. And I totally respect that, and that's understood. And get I get that hundred um, percent from my perspective when I go in. I like to know, like like you just mentioned there. I like to know as much as I, as I can, or at least a good a good chunk of information. Mm. Um, and that's that's for two reasons: for, so that I understand a bit of history about the place. So I might, and, that, and that history can include the paranormal history as well, so mm-hmm. to an extent, so I can understand how I'm going to investigate the place. But also, if then I'm working, because I often I 
don't just work with gadgets and technology. I work with obviously mediums and stuff like that. Mm. So obviously a medium picks up on something or gets some information. What I then do then is a weird thing where I take on board what comes through. I say, okay, that's cool. Brilliant. Can you get some extra? And I get interested in the bits that go beyond the knowledge that's known. So mm. anything you can chuck into Google and go, right, that comes up straight away. That comes up straight away. Brilliant. That's excellent. But I, I, anything that goes way beyond that that you have to dig into a book to find gets a little bit more interesting yeah and that's not because that's not because i'm saying that the mediums are just googling before they go and then telling me what they know because it's like you just said they might know stuff but not know that they know stuff exactly that's most that's the most difficult thing you can't prove this is (laughs) i can get this right now you can prove what you know but you can't prove what you don't know yeah if that makes sense (laughs) yeah yeah no it does it does i mean i i I agree with you there and i can understand why a medium would want to go into a place blind because there's so much there's going to be especially when you've got guests there who are there for a bit of a jolly they're 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 going to be a lot more skeptical they may not have seen that medium prove their worth before um i personally don't like looking into the hauntings of a place before i go in um but doing a show like i do and and we got a question from Kaz, actually, that I'm going to ask you in a second, actually. But doing what I do as a hobby, it's rare for me to go into a place and not know something. So there's no point in me denying it. But no. what I may not know is events that have happened there or experiences. I mean, we talked about, I think it was Langard Fort we were messaging about recently. Yes, yes. And yes. yes, I knew the history of the place. Well, I did the history talk before the investigation that night. Um, but... I didn't know any of the reported hauntings. And Kaz has just asked, have you ever walked into a location without knowing anything about it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and the reason, reason behind that is because when I, when I started off, and I've, I've, I've gone through this before recently, um, when I started off, I started in what I call the, the, the ghost hunter camp where we go out and you debunk everything, mm. basically. Um, and in that knowing stuff, I went in knowing stuff and all that kind of stuff. And I got to a point where I started getting interested in things like seances and mediumship and stuff like that and trying to understand a bit more about that and trying to figure out what that all was all about. And that's what mm-hmm. I got into, like the skull experiment. And that's where I also put myself in a position where I said, well, at the end of the day, I need to experience something in a certain way. So I spoke to mediums and stuff like that. And they said, well, just go in. Don't, don't prepare. Because I'm a stickler for preparing to mm-hmm. go into a place. So I've gone to a few places where... I don't know a thing. I've walked in. I don't know what's going on. I, I mean, I might have a small piece, like you said, I might have a small piece of information that I know about the place because I've read it as I've flown past it on the internet or yeah. someone's mentioned it in passing. So, but I've not gone into, I've not gone and looked into it on purpose. And I've gone into a place and it's been, it's been interesting. I've had some interesting experiences off the back of that. And it's, it kind of keeps adding to the questions, the pile of questions to be answered. <laughs> so to speak so it helps yeah. and i think i think everyone should do that i think you should always you should try both sides because you might oh, be well might believe it or not believe it or not kaz has just said she didn't expect that answer and it shut her up <laughs> well done <laughs> <laughs> she's going to be swearing at me now probably or throwing something at the computer she um, has to think of another question now <laughs> yeah she wants to think she needs to think of another question for you now yeah but i know we talked about langard because you know langard yes. fort quite well and i must admit i love the place um That's- I I I would love to do a lockdown in there, a proper one, yeah, just me and definitely. a couple of other people, because I did do the history. I did do a history tour. It was for Fright Nights Cambridge recently, and their their medium hadn't been able to attend, so they asked me to do a history walk around for the the guests, which I did. But I didn't talk about any of the reported hauntings. I hadn't looked up. I genuinely hadn't looked into any of them. But before I actually started the investigation, uh, before the the guests arrived. I wanted to go and have a look around to familiarise myself with the place because I'd never been there and I wanted to get oh. an idea of the layout, where the different bastions were, you know, where the um, where, where everything was anyway. And mm-hmm. I'd looked into this room and I don't know if you, I think I told you this story. I looked into this room and there's two baths in there. Yes. It, was, it was the World War One soldier's bath area. And as I'm standing there in the doorway, and I had someone with me, we heard like a scuffling noise, like shoes being scuffed on the floor. And yep. we both heard it quite loud. And we were sort of looking, we, neither of us were moving, and it was from in within the room. It wasn't where we were standing it when we were at the door. And so me being me, you know, I don't run away. I walked straight in there to see if there was an animal in there, if there was someone had got in there, when the staff was in there. There was no one in there. And as I was walking in before i got in i i heard a male breath from in the room exhale like he was sort of 
like that. That's the only way I could explain it. Now, my mm-hmm. colleague didn't hear it because he was still standing outside because he didn't want to come in. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I heard this and I could, f- you could feel it in the room. There was a, vi- a charge to the room. Mm. And when I went back in there later on, I went on, a, uh, on my own with a, a recorder to see if I could pick up on anything. Nothing came through. Nothing, no, no K2 activity, no EVPs, nothing. So I'd guess it was probably more likely to be residual than spirit and interactive but when i then looked up some of the reported hauntings from that place that particular room had been mentioned on more than one occasion by mediums mm. who picked up on a soldier who they think died in there in world war one a world war one soldier who they don't know if he killed himself or if he was accidentally killed but he was they believe he they feel that he fell and hit his head on the bath and that's where it gets interesting okay <laughs> But what was because... even more interesting, no, I'm adding to it, is when I took my kids there a couple of weeks later, not at night, oh, they're only four and eight, but as a day trip, you know, to get them to run around and run up and down the steps and tire themselves not, out, as you do. I'm not the only one then, good. No, you're not the only one. No, no, see those stairs? Run up and down them five times and then you get some sweets. <laughs> Go. Um, my youngest, who who has got some learning difficulties, who things don't necessarily, he doesn't think in a, a linear way. I suppose. Um, yeah, we'll come to that, Kaz, when we talk about Peterborough. I'm sure we'll ask Ashley what he thinks the most active part of it is. Um, the museum, not Peterborough as a general place. Um, he, We'd been looking in this room because I wanted to see if I could pick up on anything in there again. And as I came out, my youngest son was waving. And I said, who are you waving to? He said, that man standing in the corner in a soldier's uniform. I didn't tell him that that's what I'd picked up. I'd picked up on that something in that room. I st- I don't because he's only four. He wouldn't. It wouldn't. He wouldn't. But he was waving at someone. He said it was a man in a soldier's it's, uniform in the corner. It's, 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 those are the ones that kind of knock you for six, isn't it? When your kids, mm. when your kids do, things like that. and it's like I uh, think, well, there's no reason, and I don't know where you're coming from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, see, I don't worry about it because both my kids do pick up on stuff. I just, I went, all oh, right, and he went, he is very nice. He waved at me, and I saw it. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a, he, he wasn't scared or anything because I don't, I don't sort of go, oh no, no, don't speak to them, don't speak. I go, all right, okay, yes. say hello, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but it was exactly the same room that I'd had the experience in a few weeks beforehand. It's and it's it's an interesting room because when we when we investigated there years ago, I think it was like twenty ten actually. And my my sister at that point, I'm, my team, my sister would come around and she'd like, video stuff because she she works for BBC and stuff like that, does filming oh, right. stuff. Um, and she she came around with us um, and she's at Hay Festival at the moment. But if you like books, um, and stupid question. <laughs> well, I'm a carry in that respect. Yes, <laughs> I know. That's why that's why I threw that one in there. We like that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we went we went into that room, and she she and this is where it ties into what you just mentioned about the um, a soldier dying in the bath because she we didn't know she didn't know much about it then, and she she went in there, and she was like, but she didn't mention about any soldiers or anything like that. She goes, oh, I don't like this room too much. And I goes, why? Well, what's what's that then? And she goes, I've got a weird taste in my mouth. And you just think, oh, well, here we go. <laughs> and um, and but she said the taste that she had in her mouth was like an iron kind of a metally metallic yeah. kind of taste. Which obviously, if you know, t- links into blood and things like that, doesn't it? Yeah, I didn't like so, that. So I didn't feel no, like yeah. there, there <laughs> was many a sense, an ominous sense to it. But, yeah, yeah, I didn't know the, the, what these mediums have picked up on, and that that sort of thing. That's something that I do. Um, I enjoy that when that happens, because it kind of validates what I've heard or picked up on. Or, but then to have my four-year-old son who wouldn't know. That's great you know, validation. <laughs> to tell me he was waving at a soldier in the corner and it was a man in a soldier's uniform who was waving. He, it was just, you know how a little kid will just wave at someone because they've seen them? That's what he did. And I just said, who are you waving at? And he went, the man in in the soldier in the corner. <laughs> That's brilliant. See, I, love that. I love that when they do that. <laughs> Which is why, same reason I take my kids to um, um, historic locations, let's call yeah. it that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, the thing is, I have to not tell my eldest what I'm picking up on a lot of the time because he's so engrossed in it. He's constantly like, is there anyone in here? Is there...? And I'll, I can feel them. I can hear them laughing. 
And I, I give up telling him because I just feel like a performing monkey sometimes when he's <laughs> asking me what I'm picking up on. But um, I tell him I'll teach him the history, but not that bit just yet. Um, but yeah, so that that's one of the, that's where sort of coming back to what I was saying about I like knowing the history, but I won't necessarily look up necessary previous store, sort of experiences that people have had. Which is which is the difference because I, I've obviously in when I arrange an investigation or whatnot, I've investigated places. I obviously look at both mm. history and paranormal experiences and all that kind of stuff in order to get a, an understanding of what hotspots might be might be in the location, mm. so that I can focus some of the the tech if you yeah. like yeah. um and also the focus of visuals and things like that into those areas to try and understand um and that's that's what kind of tie it back in now which is and that's mm. that's why i've done certain things that i did when i went to peterborough museum to investigate there yeah. i'm actually i was about to link into peterborough <laughs> i'm i've not forgotten i've not forgotten <laughs> because what i was going to say is one of the things i use my history knowledge for is kind of as, as a trigger sometimes yeah. for the questions i'm asking so oh. I think I've told this story before as well. Ruffham, RAF at Bury St Edmunds, Ruffham Air Museum. I was explaining to a friend of mine. She asked me why so many of the air bases were in East Anglia. Still got the lights on, not set any equipment running. She asks me, and I was explaining to her, it's because East Anglia was very flat. There was a lot of land. It was a clear route straight across the North Sea to Holland and places like that where the, the a lot of the American bomber raids were taking place etc etc and that's history that was just general history that i knew and in behind us we had an american voice a male american voice going yep and we both heard it (laughs) clear as day did the typical thing went running off to see if there was someone there someone playing a trick on us no one everyone else was back in the hub area so that's when i say that i think history can be used as a trigger yep now you used triggers or is it's called also the singapore theory at peterborough yes Tell yes me about yes that. I did right so when we, when we went into peterborough museum i i done as we've been talking um quite a bit of research on well some of the history and some of the previous activity that occurred there where it occurred and stuff like that and i spoke to um the current or the sorry no, the what was the, the curator of the time which was a guy called stuart horn who knew a wealth of information about the place mm. um However, <laughs> Stuart was a, a clever guy because he wanted a bit of validation himself. So he would tell you a certain amount, yeah. but he wouldn't tell you everything. He'd miss um, this out. Yeah, to, to say if something happened, he could then quantify certain things for himself and then fill you in on, on the backstories and all that kind of stuff. Now, um, so when I, I went into all that, I mean, it, all, all the history of that place was, um, you know, it goes back years, you've, you've jumped on that now. I mean, that the paranormal history, you've had most, the likes of Most Haunted go there on a, mm-hmm. um, on their show as well, um, whether you like them or not. Um, various teams have been Us. there over the years. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, who else has been there? Uh, oh, and sorry, and, and the team, that, my, my first experience there was with, with actually with a member of Most Haunted, which was um, Phil Wyman, mm-hmm. as part of his team when we went there. And I loved the place. The first time I went there, I loved the place, which is why I went back with my own team. Now, because of the Anzac soldier story that we told in 1916, okay. um, I wanted to use the Singapore theory, which is the idea of using a trigger or something that might be related to the spirit that you're trying to get in contact with or stir up, in, you know, stir up activity around. Mm-hmm. So I went straight in with um, looking into that and the best results seem to come off the back of audio. Right. So I thought, what's the best audio? And I figured that things like music are probably the best audio. So I found about four or five different songs from around the 1916 era. Um, and then I put them onto a um, an MP3 player um, mm-hmm. and then set them on loop um, and played them from the ground floor, sort of in the hallway near to where the main staircase is. So basically the audio from these songs would then play on loop through the building for a certain amount of time. Yeah. Um, and fill the whole building with 1916 um, audio songs and that kind of stuff and that kind of superior time which although these songs were supposed to be good songs from that time when you play them in the early hours of the morning when the building's completely dark it sounds like you've just walked into a horror film <laughs> 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 quite literally which is interesting because it also plays on the psychology part of the play yeah. so which kind of sprung up straight away it's like ah <laughs> but yeah playing it on loop as well is is, is equally plays on the psychology because obviously yeah. in horror films they play the same piece of audio over and over again to drum up the um it's sort of like the, the persistent sort of thing yeah. so 
yeah so that's that's what we've done we've done that for a set period of time and then um and then we shut it off back to silence again and it was this um do you, do you want me to go into the whole the whole story now yeah please please okay it was at this point then that the um the building woke up is probably the best way to put it um the team had experiences where they saw things out the corner of their eyes they um saw things moving um and we we had a an object moving one of the vigils upstairs and when i say an object move it was like a tiny amount yeah um but um, at the time, it was the fish was this big, <laughs> kind of scenario. Yeah. But once we once we watched the video, it was it moved, but not dramatically. But the most interesting point was the fact that we all began to realise that at the bottom of the staircase, which is famous for the Anzac soldier as well, funnily enough, mm-hmm. um, we began to realise that the atmosphere there had changed. Um, we felt the temperature had dropped, yet we couldn't quantify it with a device. Um, we felt that the um, visible visible light had reduced so it seemed darker yeah in the area as well like that so darker than dark um, yeah darker than dark yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um and at that and at that point a couple of us sat on the bottom steps sort of thinking trying to figure it out what's, what's kind of going on feeling the atmosphere you know put, immersing ourselves in that particular situation and as we sat there on the top run of the of the staircase we saw like a flickering light head up the right. top of the staircase yeah. and we both kind of turned to each other and went did you see that yeah, what did you and see? And this was with your <laughs> naked eye, you saw this? We saw this with our naked eye, no cameras, yeah. nothing like that. We just saw it with a... It was literally in the one place where we didn't have a camera as well, mm. which was pretty annoying. Um, they must know, they must know, seriously. I reckon they do, because uh, when I got that voice through at Ruffham, didn't have a recorder going, and I had one going most of the time. So, yeah, yeah I think they know. they just camera shy or whatever. So yeah, so that's that's what happened. But what's interesting, we we looked at it and it's like an orange an orangey kind of glow light that kind of flickered a bit, and we was kind of that's interesting. So we we told Stuart straight away about this because like and and the first thing that jumped to my mind was because of the situation and maybe because of the music and all that. I was like, it, it seemed like a like a candlelight. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was after this was after obviously we chased it chased it up the stairs and I think we actually tried to grab one of the cameras that we had set up on a different part of the stairs to try and follow it, but we was far yeah. too slow. Um, so. We got hold of him because he basically, when you investigate, well, back in the day when we used to investigate that, he used to sit in a little office in the back and let you do all your thing. And then if anything interesting pops up, he'd appear from nowhere. Mm. Um, and he, he sort of came out and he's like, oh, right, that's interesting. And we told him about it. felt like It, was, it seemed to be like a bit of a candlelight. And he disappeared back into this room and came, cause he, and came out with this, um, this lantern um, with a candle in it. Mm-hmm. And he lit the candle, went up the top, got on the stairs and kind of walked up there. And was like, yep, that's exactly what we saw. Well, not exactly, but pretty, pretty damn similar to what we saw. Mm. Um, few moments ago as all right okay cool so he's like so that's that's how we kind of quantified it as being a bit like a candlelight Mm. but it was it was all after playing this music which i think was about like i said four or five different tracks from 1916 Mm. on loop for a little while done that that way and then things just seemed to kick off after that sort of thing could that it could it (laughs) that probably wasn't thomas though because Thomas um, wouldn't have, Thomas. I mean, if if we're on, if if we're looking at um, something yeah. maybe residual, Thomas couldn't move. You know, his spine and his legs had been shot out, it's, to put it mildly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's probably it's, more likely one of the nurses. Yes. Yeah. It's probably like, likely a, a nurse, a nurse doing checks or something like that um, in the middle of the night with a candle, because obviously they would have walked around, checked on people, and then gone back down or something like that, maybe. Mm. Um, Everyone always jumps, to the, like, as you said earlier, everyone does always jump to the most famous ghost. Mm. Uh, it, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, so it's, it, I, I find it fascinating. I mean, yeah. <laughs> in, in that respect, that that kind of kicked off, those things kicked off. I mean, as, you, as you're 100% right, Thomas, Thomas Hunter, Sergeant Thomas Hunter, sorry, um, was incapacitated. So yeah. we'd have to find out where he was in the building <laughs> yeah. um, and stuff like that before we could... Um, understand where we might find him if that makes sense yeah no that does i mean that's one of the interesting things when you 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 look at this kind of thing is if it's an actual interactive haunting a spirit as opposed to ghost or however you want to technically classify it because of the fact that he would have been i mean it doesn't say in the reports that he was paralyzed but if his injury he was injured in his spine and his legs and it was that bad that it killed him chances are he was paralyzed i mean that, that you know the, the reading between the lines yeah do we think that once he was dead 
he could move around freely again or did he keep those injuries that he died from and was still limited by them because this is one of the conversations i get into i mean we we were talking about (laughs) bill at arredale talking about arredale and saying Mm -hmm. that people go into these asylums and say the spirits are aggressive they're scary they'll shout at them they'll this they'll that well if they had a mental illness when they died they've probably still got it as spirits so if you died because you'd had your spine shot out have you still got your spine shot out as a spirit do you get what i'm saying yeah and that's that's a huge a huge a huge a huge question that I don't think we've got the answer for. I mean, it's, it's, it's a what happens next kind of question, isn't it? That's yeah. that is that is the fundamental hard question um, yeah. about survival. If if you do pass over into the spirit realm, you do hang around. Do you hang around with your injuries? Do you turn into a, a spirit that can move around freely? Mm. Do we float around? <laughs> do we always mm. walk around? Yeah. Is it, it could go on for a, an age sort of thing. I mean, it, it could could it have been Thomas Hunter walking up and down the stairs because he is the most famous ghost? located that people so many people know about him so he's he's psychically linked to the place because people have knowledge of him um that's why we people believe they see him because they feel that they see him because he is the most Mm. it's like um how can you put it it's like a post that's liked on facebook Mm. or or, um, a website on google it's higher up the rankings because it's got more likes Mm. or more visits so it's Mm. the same sort of thing with the spirit then they kind of they 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 become more linked to that situation because they have more focus from people that are still alive. But people started I, I, seeing Thomas <laughs> from the late 1920s when it was still an infirmary. Yes, it, and yes. wasn't there a story that one of the women, the nurse, who said she'd seen his ghost, as she called it, mm-hmm. had actually treated him. And so she knew who he was. Yes, I think... Yes, this this rings a, a bell yeah. actually with me. Yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that that is the case um, because there's there's the there's the nurse that saw him, but that wasn't the first. Was that the first case? I'm not yeah, sure, but I just case. remember reading. I think it was actually on your blog article on it that you sent me. But you know, people were very sort of skeptical, yes. saying, "Well, how you know how do you know it's Thomas Hunter? You're just associating his name because he's famous. The the lonely Anzac, sad story, died away from home, traumatic root wounds, and everything." But one of the, I think it the, was, yeah. the nurses who said she'd seen him, and I can't for the life of me remember her name because I didn't make a note of it, she had actually treated him and said she recognised him. Um, I, think, I think that's pretty, pretty, pretty spot on. I think, I think um, there's the, if, if, if my memory serves me right, I might, I might be wrong, I'm hoping not. I think, I think there, was a case, there was a case where some people that were, when it became a museum, or before it became a museum, when they were sort of a caretaking the place they mm. they had an encounter on the stairs mm. um the nurse one i think is one like you said um i'm just, trying, I'm just looking for some on my notes actually trying to see if i've got the name written down somewhere which i can't, can't for the life it's definitely on the note it was on the notes that you sent me um but i just i just find that i mean kerry has has put that um no as a spirit you remember the injuries and may project those as a form of identification but your soul spirit remains whole and then Kaza said, or do spirits show themselves to us as they were in life? It's an interesting point, though. But what I can't see is why Thomas would have... He would never have walked up and down stairs carrying a light. So, to me, it would be more logical um, for it to no, have I, been I more of a, a residual type haunting that was going on. And it's one of the nurses or one of the other star. It doesn't have to be a nurse. It could be anyone. Um who who was walking up and down the steps you know laid with the lamp literally and that and that makes and that makes perfect i mean a lot of a lot of activity is picked up on staircases because it is a walk it is it is one of the locations not not just not just in peter ryan museum in various places because Mm. staircases are generally a place that has a lot of footfall yes so you have a lot of people a lot of activity because a lot of people or a lot of the people or individuals go up and down through those places over and over and over again i mean if you take your own house for example i mean how many times do you go up and down the stairs in a, in a day, in a week. To get the kids thing. to go to bed a lot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, so those kind of things. And if, and if it's if, if it was a hospital as well, you'd have nurses going up and down stairs yes. doing checks and stuff like that on a regular basis. So, I I I tend to agree with you. I think logically thinking, and because of it being a, can, a kind of a candlelight flicker, I would probably attribute it to being maybe a nurse or something like that. Mm. or spirit of nurse or the residual energy of a nurse or something like that that was going up and down the stairs. If that's the case, or <laughs> 
or there's a number of other sci theories that I could throw at it, but I'm not going to tonight. <laughs> okay, we'll save that one. We'll save that one for another day. Uh, I mean, the other thing as well is is that Peterborough wasn't a military hospital, no. and and I I went through all the military as many World War One military records as I could find to see if I could find any other soldiers who were treated there, and mm. I couldn't find any. Now, it may be that, that there were, but for some reason it's not, they're not listed or they weren't active at the time when they were treated there. But I couldn't find any other reasons for a uniform to have been seen. That's, that's a valid point, actually, to be fair. It's a good point. Which means mm-hmm. that if, a, if people do see our Anzac soldier, then it'd be the most easiest one to identify yeah. because they'll have a uniform. Yeah. yeah. And like I say, it, because Peterborough wasn't a military hospital... It wouldn't have had, you know, if if you'd been looking at one of the, 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 you know, even something like Highlands House in Chelmsford, which was a military hospital during World War One, I, I would expect to see a, a soldier. Well, I mean, it was the SAS headquarters in World War Two, so it had a lot of military bias to it. But Peterborough wasn't a military hospital. It was never commandeered as a military hospital. So um, there were parts of Peterborough that were used for military, but not the infirmary so that could be the other reason why his death there shocked everyone so much because they hadn't seen those kind of injuries and it kind of hit home that maybe they felt it was um they had loved ones away fighting and that was their way of caring for their loved ones who they couldn't care for um I mean, Kerry, Kerry says that she agrees on that point that it was probably a nurse, but it may have actually been Thomas's nurse, um, which is where the link was. That she, that's why the link still stands. But it, it could equally, it could equally be where the side three comes with it. It could equally have been the nurse that then later saw him later on, yeah. that then claimed to have seen him that yeah, <laughs> originally saw him. Could have been. So you've got like a, a, almost like a time loop. So what else did you encounter at? <laughs> at Peterborough when you were there at the museum um it's an it is an interesting place i mean like i said we we had um the the mo- the, ob- the object that moved which wasn't dramatically moved i mean it didn't like move across the room like a par- like a like a pole ice case but um there on the first floor at that particular time there were some reports about objects moving around and it's and us being associated with children mm-hmm. so um and that particular a- area of the museum at that particular point in time as well um, had an area set up for children, so it had like blocks and tables and things like that, so they can play and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so what we done is we set up, but you know things like tiles of blocks for them to knock over and stuff like that. And there was a particular there was a ball in one, at one location, and we just like saying like you know just just push the ball, move the ball, and, and we were filming it at the time, um, and it moved. Um, it doesn't move a huge amount, um, but we know it. <laughs> we know that it couldn't have been anything to do with us that had moved it yeah. because. Yeah. And um, we danced around it afterwards, pretty much to make sure that if our, our foot fall on the floor, oh, we've would all make done it. it. We've all done it. <laughs> <laughs> Just answer that. But um, we looking at it afterwards because obviously we tried to recreate to understand what ha- what had happened. And mm. the only way that, that that particular object would move at the time was if if you pushed it with a finger. And like I said, it wasn't a dramatic amount that it moved, but it moved. But it took us a lot of. And, and this is where, because at that time I was, like I said, I the old ghost hunters kind of debunking kind of hat on. Mm. Um, we, we looked into it a lot, you know, you know how it could have happened and could it have been us? No, it wasn't us. So the only thing left was that it must have been a ghost or a spirit that must have moved it for us. Brilliant. Okay. Now, later on down the line from this, I, I then look at other things like um, uh, psychokinesis and stuff like that and uh, telekinesis, mm. on your point of view. Um, the effort and the amount that the group of, I think it was about four people four or five people that were in that room at that time that were trying to encourage said children to move objects um the effort that we put in could quite have easily enough been enough to generate enough psychic energy to move the object ourselves so it might not have actually been a spirit unfortunately sorry um that moved it It might have been us so it could have been power of the mind rather than power of the spirit so to speak but it's 50 50 But, but the point and the fact is that we was in a hall in building and we don't know which it was. <laughs> Can't prove it. So, either which way. part of Peterborough Museum? Coming back to Kaz's question, yeah. which would you say was the most active part? Is that the stairs? Um, given my personal experiences, I'd probably say um, the stairs, the stairs, and probably the and the first floor. I mean, 
Um, I know previously you said I said like the cellar, which you have mm. to go outside to go down into, which is like the oldest part of the building. Yeah, that dates they back often, to the fifteen hundreds. Yeah, they often say that's quite haunted, and people have you know some interesting and quite dark experiences down there. I mean, I've sat down there and watched what I thought was shadows moving across, but then it could have quite easily been because because it's quite dark down there. Mm. Your eyes mm. constantly adjusting with yeah. what light, what light is left and sort of thing. Then um, I, I kind of. On the, on the fence on that one but a lot of people have been down there and said they've had some really dark sort of um experiences but i've i've laid in a room in, on on the side in the room on there in my own on had nothing <laughs> so mm. um which is why I, I think maybe the state the main staircase on, onto the first floor is probably the most most sort of active area i mean okay. what's the other area that people say oh the back staircase is also another area that people say is quite active but i've not really had that much there apart from maybe a few taps and raps so. I know it definitely looks like. I mean, we're talking about we're talking about joking about. I mean, Kaz says something about using the kids as spirit detectors. You know, joking aside, it, I've I've looked up Peterborough Museum and it definitely looks like somewhere I'd like to take the kids and and the programs they have for school kids, like they do oh, actually brilliant. have people being some of the original characters. I say they don't think they have anyone, you know, acting as as Sergeant Hunter, but they do have people assuming roles from the past which i think is a great way to teach the kids history and is a great way to get them interested and i want to go on one of these reenactments so the kids <laughs> I, want, I want to go i want to go and see if i can get them to it, it, fall out of character with questions i'm asking but it does look a really you know for nobody thinks of peterborough as being a particularly sort of you know you think of canterbury or you think of london oh, or you think of massively historic yeah, yeah. But it's no, actually no, got a hell of a lot going for it. Yes, yeah, no, it has that. And the museum's the museum's great. I mean, I've, I've, obviously, the great thing about investigating, as many people probably that are tuning into the show and stuff like that, probably realise is you get to go to locations like this and wander around them in the dark. But oh, it's you also the best get to go, it's the best you thing. get you get to go when there's nobody else there. Yeah, I know. Um, and the brilliant thing about Peterborough Museum, the last time I went, and I think they've probably still got it, is they've actually um, re-kitted out all the. Um, because when I investigated at this particular point in time, you couldn't access the the um, uh, the what's it called the uh, the room the, sur- the room where they do all the surgery, the operating theatre, the, the, the operating theatre, yeah, the theatre. Yeah. So at that point in time, we couldn't access it. But then I've been back since, and it's now accessible. Wow! Um, and they've they've done it all up, and they've got all the the, the bed in there and all that kind of stuff, and they've cleared yeah. it all out, and they've got the the buckets of blood um and all that kind of and all the gruesome tools they used to use and that kind of stuff it's, that looks like it's something out of a horror film yeah um but it's actually what they used to use yes. <laughs> so yeah yeah and when and when you look at that because obviously when you look at that and then put that into con into sort of like context with like the anzac soldiers time and all that kind of stuff you begin yeah. to think oh actually to be fair we've come on leaps and bounds in medical yeah. sort of like realms so yeah it's, yeah. it's a fantastic place. I'd like well, to I didn't want to go lab. into the World War One advances in medical science that they made because it always does seem to be in wartime that we yeah. make massive leaps in medical science. And I didn't want to go into all of that. But now we all want to, as Cass said, I know I want to go to Peterborough Museum now. I'm, I'm trying to work out if I can take the kids there and use my little spirit detectors, see if they pick up on anything. Because if one of them starts talking with an Australian accent, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> something's there. Um, well, thank you, thank you so much for your time, Ashley. I'm That's sorry right. about the the technical glitch um, at the right. beginning. <laughs> I mean, we've mentioned your blog, which is brilliant, which we do share on Parasearch whenever you do a new one. You've also got your website, which the address is. Uh, yeah, the blog's on on the website, which is ashleyneb dot com. So it's nice and nice and easy. Nice and, and easy. And that's that's. That's also linked on the Parasearch website as well, it so you is, can get yeah. stuff there. So, I was just giving you a chance to promote yourself. It's I, I yeah, I'm not very good at promoting myself. It's <laughs> it's uh, there's new things new things all the time. I'm going to go into promotion mode. Now. Go on, do your um, promotion. It's um, it, there's new things going up there all the time. I'm I'm trying to get new new streams of blogs and stuff. So like, everyone everyone knows about the Psy theory ones. So I've got I've got all that up there. That keeps I keep adding to that because otherwise I have to get stuff out of my head onto the thing. Um. I mentioned earlier about the 20, 20 most haunted locations in the yes. world, yep. which I'm doing as well at the moment. Um, and look, I'm trying to add some extra bits and pieces to that, but I'm not going to mention just yet because I'm going to okay. launch that properly next month. But hopefully it'll be something that will I help a lot of people to find what they're looking for in the paranormal field, oh. um, like I used to um, mm. look for, but have to go to a million websites. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Okay. A, one-stop, a one-stop place for everything. Oh. Um, 
but yeah um and also i'm busy busy trying to compile some of my blogs into books and stuff like that as well yeah so yeah because you've been asking for, for well, everyone for research um like experiences i think that's why i sent you the langard one wasn't uh, it yes now the other, that's that's another bit of another project i'm doing on the side which is uh, working with some of the other guys like kerry and stuff like that and kaz as well who's in the chat room um yes, in regards is. to um gathering lots of data and stuff like that to create a proper data set so we can look at different locations with different experiences and stuff like that and then tie them into certain theories and stuff like that and hopefully come up with some ideas to you know put together some proper proper proper, proper papers and stuff like that on paranormal ideas and stuff well if you hang on after we finish the interview i've got a couple more probably to give you okay brilliant <laughs> right. I, won't, I won't bore everyone with them on air because they've probably heard them before but you may not have heard them before actually so um but anyway thank you so much for for staying with us and um That's what right. you guys didn't realize is when this wasn't working ashley because he's he's an it person we were sharing <laughs> screens on skype so we could see if we could work out between the two of us what was what was going on but the good old switch it on and off again ended up always works always works in the end doesn't <laughs> it? it just takes time um but yeah so thanks ever so much for everyone who stuck with us and who tuned in thanks again to our good friend ashley nib for his his time and uh talking about peterborough museum i think the curators there are probably going to hate us because we're all going to be phoning up wanting to go um all that leaves me to say is don't forget that parasearch radio has shows on six nights of the week you can catch them all on spreaker if that's your that's your poison or please do go over to our new youtube channel subscribe to the channel and then you can listen to as many shows as you like on there and leave comments and all of that stuff but until next week you lovely lot all that leaves me to say is have a, a good evening what's left of it sleep tight and don't worry too much about things that go bump in the night thank you for listening don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.